from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. I am Carolyn Brown, Director of the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for a lecture by uh, Dr. J. Michael Francis entitled Murder and Martyrdom in Spanish Florida, uh, the Don Juan and the Guale Uprising of 1597. Just a reminder before we start, please turn off any cell phones or other electronic equipment that can go off and disturb the speaker or interfere with the recording. Uh, Dr. J. Michael Francis received his doctorate in history from the University of Cambridge. And since 1997, he's been teaching at the University of North Florida, where he was currently professor and chair of the Department of History. Dr. Francis has published numerous articles on the history of early colonial New Granada, that is modern day Colombia, and Spanish Florida. His book, Invading Colombia, was published in 2008 in the Penn State University Press. Dr. Francis' most recent book, entitled Murder and Martyrdom in Spanish Florida, Don Juan and the Guali Uprising of 1597, clearly the book from which his talk is being drawn today, uh, was published in 2011 by the American Museum of Natural History. At present, Dr. Francis is completing his next book project, Martyrs of Florida, which is already under contract, University Press of Florida. Since 2008, Dr. Francis has served on the editorial board of the University Press of Florida. His numerous awards and honors include a Cushwa grant from the University of Notre Dame, a Franklin Research Grant from the American Philosophical Society, and the Alfred J. Beveridge Award from the American Historical Society. Uh, in 2007, Dr. Francis received a four-year appointment as research fellow at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, and in 2011, he was named by U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, uh, to the uh, St. Augustine's 450th Commemoration Committee, that is commemorating the founding of the city of St. Augustine. Apparently quite an interesting um, city in and of itself. Uh, last year, Dr. Francis was here at the Kluge Center. He was the uh, Jay Kislak long-term fellow um, here in Washington and was a really delightful and wonderful presence for eight months in the Kluge Center. Um, he made special use, as you can imagine, of the J. Kislak uh, collection, uh, which is, includes books, manuscripts, historical documents, maps, and artifacts of the Americas, um, and a collection that emphasizes native cultures of the southeastern U.S. of Mesoamerica um, and the Caribbean region. Um, and the time period is from earliest contact with Europeans up through about 1820. So that's the Kislak collection. Some of you may have special interest in that. Uh, this afternoon, we will get a small window on uh, Dr. Francis's research. Um, and uh, I think it probably should be fun. I don't know how a, a subject that's called murder and martyrdom uh, can't be a little bit uh, amusing, at least when you're not the subjects of it. Um, so therefore, I ask you if you would please welcome Dr. Michael Francis. Thanks so much. Uh, is there a way maybe to dim these top lights that you can see the slides a, a little bit better? Or can we not do that? Is that, if it's impossible, it's not a problem. Let me begin by saying how much I love the way you say murder and martyrdom. And if, if this ever goes to books on tape, I want you to record it. Well, welcome to Murder and Martyrdom in Spanish Florida. The subtitle for this talk, when I tried to push it to NBC or CBS, was CSI Spanish Florida. Uh, and I'm going to talk about an episode that has been largely overlooked 
least in Spanish uh, Florida historiography. How many of you are even familiar with this story of this uprising in Florida in 1597, 10 years before Jamestown? It's not a well-known <laughs> episode. It, it really isn't. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about one part of the book, uh, this murder and martyrdom in, in Spanish Florida tale. Uh, before I do that, I want to just draw your attention to uh, this map. Uh, if we could go back to Florida in 1597, in the early fall on the eve of this uprising, uh, this is in effect what Spanish Florida looks like. Uh, the only permanent Spanish settlement in Florida at this time was St. Augustine. Even though the Spanish had uh, much earlier established some garrisons in southern Florida, in central Florida, uh, some garrisons in the Tennessee Valley and North Carolina, and of course the capital of Spanish Florida for 20 years between 1566 and 1586 was on an island in modern day South Carolina called Paris Island. But by the time we get to 1597, the only Spanish garrison left in all of what the Spanish claimed as the provinces of La Florida, uh, which of course for Spain extended from uh, the very southern part of the Keys all the way up to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. The reality of Spanish Florida was that it was this small garrison of about 300 individuals, 30% of whom were Portuguese. So this is what we're talking about when we speak about Spanish Florida. There were Irishmen at the time. The parish priest in St. Augustine was an Irishman, a uh, member of the Order of Malta. There were some Germans there. There were a handful of Frenchmen, and then the rest uh, uh, Frenchmen, and some Flemish as well. And uh, in 1597, before the uprising, there were a series of Spanish missions, Franciscan missions to be precise. <clears throat> Uh, two in St. Augustine itself, uh, one called Nombre de Dios, uh, the other San Sebastian, one on uh, just uh, off uh, the St. John's River on uh, Fort George Island, a place called San Juan del Puerto, and then uh, some missions up in what we call Wale territory. And I show you this map because I think it's important to establish uh, some kind of geographical space for what I'm going to be discussing because this is something that's not familiar, I don't think, to uh, large numbers of people, not even within the state of Georgia or the state of Florida. So when I speak of Wale territory, I'm really talking about this region bound by the Santilla or Santilla River uh, up to the Ogeechee River here. So this area here we call Wale. Sometimes we call it Wale territory. I'll probably refer to it as Wale territory. The Spanish documents always call it la lengua de Wale. In other words, the tongue. This is a place where people speak the same language. And just south of that, and the reason I show it is it will become important in this 400-year-old uh, murder mystery as I reconstruct it. The boundary at this river here, just south of that, this is modern-day Cumberland Island, a uh, place that the Spanish had established a mission called San Pedro. And this particular island will play an important role in the uprising story. It's important to remember that that island's inhabitants were not Wale. Uh, they were, for lack of a better term, uh, Mokama Tamuqua, or coastal Tamuqua. The problem with that term is Tamuqua in the 16th century is one specific village. It's not a group of people. They never collectively refer to themselves as Tamuqua. Instead, it's a place somewhere in the interior. We don't know where, we're not sure archaeologically whoop, uh, where the site is, but it's somewhere in the interior. <clears throat> so we'll call them uh, Mokama. Uh, these are, in 1597, the only missions, Franciscan missions, the only missions, in fact, that existed in Florida at the time. Uh, the Jesuits had attempted to establish missions in South Florida between 1566 and, and 1570. Uh, in fact, they had established a mission up near Chesapeake Bay, so we're in this area uh, after a handful of them were murdered uh, in an uprising uh, near Chesapeake Bay. The Jesuits decided Florida is not for us. I think we'll try Mexico. <laughs> 
and they uh, didn't return uh, to Florida. That was it for their six-year Florida uh, experiment. So how then, with this story that's not well known to many people, how on earth did I get involved trying to trace this fourth century murder mystery and use it really as, as a window through which to talk about Spanish-Indian relations, uh, the nature of Spanish rule in uh, colonial Florida, and more importantly, the relationship between different indigenous chiefdoms. This is really what the, uh, the, the book is, is about. I'm not going to talk about all of those issues uh, today, uh, but I do think it's important to explain a little bit how this thing was started. Uh, in 2006, I started a program at UNF at the University of North Florida to teach students how to read 16th century Spanish paleography. Uh, you would think, yeah, they're knocking the door down to take this <laughs> class. Uh, in fact, the enrollment has been surprisingly good. I don't know what it is. I guess it's one of those things you can go to the bar and say, I know how to read 16th century Spanish paleography, uh, and people are stunned. Well, for the first exam, I gave them a document. I thought it'll be interesting to show them a document on 16th century Florida. At the time, I was, my research was really on 16th century Colombia or, or New Granada. And so I found this document, which is digitized and available on a marvelous website that the Spanish government has put together. And it was supposed to record an Indian revolt from 1597. That's the way that it's cataloged on their website. In fact, it's not from 1597. I mean, 77 was how it's cataloged. It's from 1598. And I started to read this document, and it told the story of five Franciscan friars who were murdered in the missions in Spanish Florida, what is now the state of Georgia, uh, in the late fall of 1597. One of them had been taken captive. And he was held for 10 months in captivity, later wrote a captivity narrative, and we'll come back to this uh, character, a really fascinating guy. Well, five of the friars were killed, and this document tells this story. It also relates the story of seven young Indian boys who were captured from that territory, brought to St. Augustine, and interrogated. One of those young boys, an Indian named Lucas, who'd been baptized with the name Lucas, is actually waterboarded. It's a 16th century waterboarding, and we'll come back to him a little bit later. He subsequently confesses that he witnessed the, murders of, the murder of one particular friar, and he was subsequently found guilty uh, for his participation in this uprising. And the following day, he was marched through the streets of St. Augustine, uh, taken to the gallows, and executed, hanged. And that was it. In fact, he's the only person in this entire story who's officially interrogated and punished for his alleged participation in this uh, episode. So that's how the story started. And I had a student of mine who said, well, what do we know about this episode? I said, well, I know that the five Franciscan friars are currently under consideration for canonization. And that was about it. The general storyline, which I'll get to, uh, I was somewhat familiar with the general storyline. But I thought, well, this might be an interesting project for the student to pursue over the course of the semester. So I said, let's go see what we can find. So beyond this document, we started to look back at the early historiography of missions and, and the uprising. And you know, you don't have to go back very far. In the middle of the 1920s, uh, the, this classic work by Mary Ross and Herbert Bolton called The Debatable Land, in which this you know, wonderfully enthusiastic scholar, uh, Mary Ross, uh, had identified these coquina ruins in Florida. And what she really wanted to do was to demonstrate that Florida had a rich mission history long before the missions were established in California and the Southwest, and, and wanted, in a sense, to celebrate that history. Well, she had identified these ruins as some of the ruins of these missions. These are tabby uh, constructions. And it didn't take long before scholars really assaulted uh, Mary Ross's scholarship in a way that she never uh, produced another piece of work again. Uh, she was literally vilified uh, 
by uh, fellow scholars, who demonstrated, I think, uh, well, certainly uh, convincingly, that these, in fact, are not 16th or 17th century missions, but they're 19th century coquina constructions. So we were left, really, with a, uh, a real dearth. None of the early missions, none of those archaeological sites had been found until we get to the early 1980s on an island called St. Catherine's Island, which is about 50 miles south of Savannah. St. Catherine's Island is about the size of Manhattan, and it's literally like going back to Jurassic Park. It's a magnificent place. Uh, there's been almost no development on St. Catherine's Island since the end of the U.S. Civil War. It's what those barrier islands should look like before all of the development that completely transformed what the barrier islands on, of, off the coast of Florida and Georgia uh, look like today. Well, in 1981, the American Museum of Natural History, led by uh, archaeologist David Hurst Thomas, discovered what so many archaeologists had been looking for, and namely one of the missions. Now, whether this is the mission that was there in 1597, uh, we're still debating. But it's certainly the 17th century site of the mission that was reconstructed on this particular, uh, at this particular location in 1981. Uh, this shows you, when they uh, finished the excavation, the caretaker on the island, brilliant man, uh, decided, why don't we plant palm trees where the post holes were located? So what you have here is the church. Here's another picture. Uh, these two palm trees represent the post holes that supported the main door. And so this is the mission church that you would have entered uh, going into this uh, church in the, in, the, uh, in the 17th century. Underneath they found about 400 to 450 Wale Indian uh, burials with tens of thousands of blown glass beads beads from Bohemia, from France, from Italy. This is a place that most scholars consider the absolute uh, backwater of Spanish Florida in the colonial period, a place where people eke uh, some kind of uh, existence by scratching the soil for edible roots. And, uh, and this is a notion that I think needs to be reevaluated. Uh, it is uh, the story of colonial Florida is not that. So of these tens of thousands of beads, some of them are religious artifacts, but most of them, in fact, are secular, which raised some very interesting questions about what was going on between the lone Franciscan or two Franciscans and those that they sought to convert to Christianity. The Franciscan correspondence, if one reads all of that correspondence, says the Franciscan correspondence says absolutely nothing about these kinds of beads in burials. Uh, those burials, in fact, should be very simple burials, uh, arms crossed, feet towards the altar, and uh, very few, if any, grave goods. And th this, uh, th these burials were literally filled uh, with these grave goods. So this started to raise some questions about the relationship between Spanish Franciscan friars and those they sought to uh, convert. And perhaps uh, the story that the Franciscan sources tell us uh, needs to be reevaluated in light of what we know from the archaeology. Having said that, that is the one early mission. None of the other Georgia missions have been found archaeologically yet. Not even the two missions that existed in St. Augustine, one of the places where there's probably been more archaeological work than, uh, than anywhere on uh, the eastern seaboard. Uh, at least for Spanish Florida, and have, they've not found uh, the 16th century uh, mission yet. So what's the story? Getting uh, finally to this episode of this uh, 1597 revolt. Well, the story was told about 20 years after the uprising by a Franciscan chronicler named Luis Jerónimo de Ore. Really fascinating guy, was born in Peru in 1554, uh, spent a lot of time there, learned to speak Quechua and Aymara. In the 17th century, Ore conducted uh, two pastoral visitations uh, to Florida. One in 1614, and that was a very short uh, visitation, and then he returned in 1617 into 1618. And he uh, interviewed a whole series of people who lived there, fellow Franciscan friars and others, 
and he compiled a material for a uh, work that he subsequently published in Madrid called The Martyrs of Florida. And this was probably published in about 1619 in Madrid. Uh, this is the first page of this chronicle. Uh, the only extant copy of this original is at the University of Notre Dame. I believe there's one in Spain, uh, but the University of Notre Dame is the only place in the United States that has it. Well, what does Ode say? Well, two of the chapters, the whole book is really a, a celebration of the friars uh, from different uh, orders. He talks about the Jesuits, he talks about secular clergy, mainly about his fellow Franciscans. And the idea is to, uh, the, behind the book was to, uh, to celebrate their uh, achievements, uh, their labors, and to lament uh, those who lost their lives uh, in the name of Christianity. And so two of the chapters in this book are about the 1597 Wale uprising. One is a chapter that Ode writes. The second is his copy of that one Franciscan friar who was held captive for 10 months. Ore claims to have found that original captivity narrative in Havana, Cuba, and he copied it. And so two of the chapters in this book tell the story of this uprising. Well, what is it? Uh, Ore argues that the uprising tale <clears throat> effectively begins in a place called Tolomato. Uh, we're not quite sure which archaeological site in Georgia corresponds to Tolomato. Again, this is one of the challenges that we're still uh, you know, really struggling with is identifying some of these places archaeologically uh, and the names. In any case, it's close to where it's located in this map. And this is in uh, Georgia. Uh, if I can just sneak over here just a little bit. Uh, here you have Osaba Island and St. Catherine's Island where they found that mission. Uh, here's Sapelo Island, St. Simon's, Jekyll. So if some of you are familiar with the Georgia coast, uh, that's where this is located. So Tolomato was on the mainland, just quite close to St. Catherine's Island. And there are some uh, contact period archaeological sites there. Uh, we just haven't been able to definitely, definitively uh, state that they, are, uh, that they represent Tolomato. Well, Ore's claim is, is quite simple. And that is, uh, at Tolomato, the resident Franciscan friar had forbidden, in Ore's mind, the paramount chief, uh, a title that the Wale called Mico Mayor, or paramount chief, they, that the Franciscan friar prevented the paramount chief from having more than one wife. Well, this paramount chief, uh, his name was Don Juan or Juanillo, Little John. And I'm going to call him Little John for the rest of the talk because there's another Don Juan, Big John. Uh, and I don't want you to confuse the two. Uh, so Little John wanted to have more than one wife. The friar uh, said, no, you've been baptized. You're a Christian. You get to keep the one that you have and be happy with her uh, because you will not get another. Well, Little John was not pleased with this order, so he secreted off into the interior where he gathered a military force, and he crept back into Tolomato early one morning, burst into the residence of this uh, friar, and subsequently ordered uh, that he be clubbed over the head with a weapon called a makana, hard wood wooden sword, effectively spilling the friar's uh, brains all over the floor, and that was it uh, for uh, the resident friar. Well, this didn't assuage his anger. He said, not only do I want this guy dead, I want all the other friars dead. So he sent orders to all of his subject chiefs in the different locations uh, in Georgia uh, where the Wale resided, ordering them to kill their resident friars. So the two friars on St. Catherine's Island uh, stationed there uh, were subsequently murdered, followed by the priests, uh, the friars, at Chupiqui and at Asal. One of those friars was injured. This is Fray Francisco de Avila. He was injured in the initial assault, and he was taken captive and moved up to this area in northern Georgia, where he was held uh, for 10 months in captivity. This is effectively the story. And the Ore version of this story has not changed very much in the historiography uh, in 400 years. 
Some scholars have claimed, well, it coincided with also a drought and the, the Wale were tired of uh, paying the maize tribute. Uh, others uh, have said that no, the, the friars were also interfering in Wale political affairs. But the question of interfering in the practice of polygamy uh, is central to every secondary account of this uprising. That's the storyline. When I first read the general storyline, some of it seemed rather unsettling. The first thing is the more one reads about this period, the more one realizes that little John, in fact, was not the paramount chief. He was the heir to the paramount chiefdom. The paramount chief was another Indian named Don Francisco. So it raises the question, by what authority did little John have to order all of the other friars killed? How can he do this? Uh, let's go down to the next. That's a makana, so you can see roughly it looks something like this. Uh, this is certainly not taken from the missions. The mission churches would have been wattle and daub constructions with thatch uh, huts, not uh, European stone uh, buildings. Uh, that storyline, as I said, hasn't changed uh, much uh, in, since Ore's Chronicle uh, was published. And what I'd like to do today is offer an alternative reading uh, to this uprising. A reading that tries to look more closely at uh, Indian motivations to say, well, not only was it unsettling that uh, Don Juanillo was not the paramount chief and, and couldn't uh, authorize that, but then the other question that remained unsettling is why take one friar captive? Why not kill all six? So these were questions that nobody had really thought about. They seemed very basic. Uh, seem rather logical kinds of queries, uh, but nobody had really looked into these questions of why keep one alive and, and, uh, and how does Don Juanillo have this authority to do that? So I'm going to, uh, after spending, I guess, the last four years looking into this issue, uh, three lengthy trips to, uh, to Spain, uh, work in the Jesuit archives and the Vatican archive, almost nine months here. Uh, I know all of you are thinking, well, why are these friars then killed and who did it? Uh, and I probably should begin by saying, after all that time, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Those are two answers that uh, I don't think we will ever be able to, two questions I don't think we will ever be able to answer. And so now half the audience is leaving and saying, well, that was a complete waste of my time. But there is an alternative reading to this that certainly presents this uprising in a very different way. And it requires we go back two years before the missions were established in Wale territory to the year 1595. And in that year, a Spanish vessel uh, sank just off the coast of Georgia. And some of the survivors from that shipwreck ended up somewhere close to a place called Wolf Island. And the survivors moved in, and uh, within a couple of days, they were rescued by a young chief uh, from a place called Asau. Asau is one of the locations where the missions were. Uh, one of the missions was located at Asau, and the resident friar at Asau was murdered in this 1597 episode. Well, this chief rescues the, the, this uh, group of Spanish captives, one of whom was a young boy about his age, 17 or 18 years old, and escorts them down to St. Augustine, all of the survivors. He takes them down, provides them food, and escorts them down to the Spanish capital. And while he's there, this young uh, uh, Indian chief from Asau is baptized, and he takes the name of St. Augustine's governor, Don Domingo. Uh, and we're going to talk much more about Don Domingo. You know, in, even in some of the works, some of the uh, scholars refer to this uprising as Don Juanillo's Revolt, or Juanillo's Revolt, Little John's Uprising. I think if the uprising has a name, it probably should be Don Domingo's Revolt. And he's a guy who's almost entirely ignored in all the literature. So instead of going into, I think, too many details, I want to trace his course through this uprising episode. Well, he gets down to St. Augustine, he's baptized, and he takes the governor's name, Domingo. 
Shortly thereafter, the governor goes up to Wale territory and establishes these missions, these early formal Franciscan missions in Wale territory. Uh, sends the six Franciscan friars to serve there. In exchange for those missions, the Wale leave a handful of young boys in St. Augustine. Now this is customary Spanish practice from the very beginning. In fact, it goes back to reconquest and even before. Uh, in these conquest, uh, in these uh, early colonial encounters, the idea was to take young children of the elite, sometimes girls, but more often than not boys, uh, train them, uh, educate them in uh, Christianity and Spanish, and the idea is that once they went back to their communities, they would be loyal allies. They would help convert their subjects, and they would be uh, close allies with the Spanish. And so this was the idea. And they left a handful of these young boys down in Wale territory and sent the five Franciscan friars on their own. So the one island, St. Catherine's Island, was the only island where there were two friars. All of the other missions had one friar. That was it. There were no Spanish soldiers there. They were on their own. And for two years, there is nothing in the documentary evidence that suggests any kind of unrest. The friars never explain or, or claim that they're fearful for their lives. They never ask for support, uh, military support to protect them. Certainly they ask for goods to be sent uh, back up and they travel quite freely, but there's no indication uh, that something is afoot in Wale territory until the fall of 1597. So two years they've been there. And what happens in the fall of 1597? Well, on October the 4th, precisely St. Francis Day of, Oct of, of 1597, a Wale war party of a, anywhere between 23 and 26 canoes. These are large war seafaring canoes, probably held about 400 warriors altogether. These canoes paddled along the intracoastal, right next to Cumberland Island. This is just north. And remember, Cumberland Island is not Wale, remember. It's Mokama Tamukwa. And so they paddle down here before the sun comes up, and they end up somewhere on the southern part of the island, at which point warriors from two of those canoes disembark. They secret into uh, the community, and they surround the council house. Well, one, not necessarily, uh, the residence of an elite Indian named Antonio Lopez. Now, there were two Franciscan friars on this island, uh, and the, the Wale War Party does nothing to these two Franciscan friars. They move in, they surround this residence of this uh, Indian named Antonio Lopez, at which point a dog starts barking. And Antonio Lopez's uncle comes out of the residence because he thinks, uh-oh, they're going to scare uh, Antonio's, the, the chief's uh, horse, and he'll be mad, and so I better get the dog to be quiet. As soon as he walks out of his residence, he's shot by arrows, and he's hit five times. He struggles back into the residence and claims, we're under attack, they've come to wage war on us. At which point, all of the residents in San Pedro come out of their homes, get armed, and chase this war party away. They capture some of the Wale, immediately execute them. And the rest of the Wale war party canoes back up north to Wale territory. When they get up in this area here, uh, the residents on this island of a place called Behesi claim that they see this war party canoe by. And who should be standing on the front of one of the war canoes wearing one of the dead friar's hats and carrying his arquebus but Don Domingo? Nobody mentions seeing Don Juanillo or Don Juan in this attack. Little John, uh, he's not even uh, uh, recorded in this. Well, you can imagine how this attack affected the two Franciscan friars on the island at the time. They immediately send a letter. Uh, this is a copy, actually, of that letter that they send to the governor in St. Augustine. And they say, you need to come up here immediately. We think something terrible has happened to our fellow Franciscans in the Wale missions, and we've just been attacked by a Wale war party. So the governor immediately sends a, uh, an expeditionary force. He prepares his own and literally empties St. Augustine of more than half of its military force to go up to investigate. 
And he subsequently launches this investigation into Wale territory to go to the missions. Now, in Ore's Chronicle, this classic work that everyone has repeated, after the interfering friar who did not like uh, the idea of Little John having more than one wife, after he's clubbed over the head, Ore tells us he was then decapitated and that his head was placed on a pike right by the boat launch at Tolomato as a warning to all Spaniards and certainly to Franciscans uh, that they're not going to tolerate this kind of interference any longer. So Don, uh, the, the governor in St. Augustine launches this punitive expedition and he spends 10 days in Wale territory and manages to capture nobody. He doesn't know what's going on. He's enormously frustrated by all of this. But what does he find? Well, he gets up to Tolomato, where the paramount chief resides. The village is empty. The church has been burned to the ground, as has the friar's residence. Clearly some indication that this was a, a, an attack against the friars. But what else do they find? Well, they find that the council house has also been burned to the ground. So why would Little John and the paramount chief, Don Francisco, burn their own council house? They then move to, to Wally Island or St. Catharines. There they find that, uh, of course, then when they get to Tolomato at the boat launch, do they see uh, one of the friars' uh, heads on a pike? Nothing. They never find him, in fact. They never find his remains. Uh, that is one of the myths that uh, has been carried down over the centuries, that his skull is somewhere to be found by archaeologists. Uh, they never find his remains. Uh, they get to St. Catherine's Island, and they find in a shallow uh, burial the remains of the two friars there, buried in front of a cross, in front of the church. Interesting that they would be buried there. Why bury them if you're so angry at these friars? Why bury them at the church? Uh, why not simply uh, uh, dismember them, toss them into the woods or into the water? And could it be that the people who buried them were not the same people who killed them? You know, these were questions that we were coming up with as we were thinking about the inconsistencies in the documentary evidence. Then they moved to Tupiki, where one of the other friars uh, had resided. What do they find at Tupiki? The entire village had been razed to the ground. Then they get to Asau, where Don Domingo was the chief, down at Asau. This is the last place that they visit on November the 6th. What do they find there? Everything is still standing. So what's happened here? Uh, why this uh, differential uh, burning episodes in these different villages? And certainly at this point, the governor uh, is thinking this Domingo uh, character is looking quite guilty. We already have all these witnesses claim that they saw him wearing his friar's hat. He was carrying his arquebus. He had led this assault on uh, Cumberland Island on San Pedro, and now he's disappeared. He was public enemy number one. This was the guy that uh, the Spanish governor really wanted to find. Now, at the same time, uh, he doesn't cap, uh, is unable to, um, uh, to find any witnesses to interrogate. So what does the governor do? He solicits the uh, alliance. He, he arranges an alliance with a chief north of Wale territory, someone that he identified as an enemy of Wale. And he said, you're enemies with Wale. I would like to arrange an accord. I'd like you to launch your own punitive expeditions into Wale on my behalf. And I've heard rumors that one of the friars is still alive. And I'd like you to verify that for me. So he gave him some time. Six months pass. And the governor goes back up north to negotiate uh, with this particular chief. The chief gives him some scalps, just some random scalps, and says, here are some scalps from some wale uh, that we managed to capture as your loyal ally in this uh, affair. And we've heard that one of the friars, Francisco de Avila, is still alive. And he's being held captive. And so the Spanish then, the governor uh, sails some, uh, just to the south, close to Tolomato, and he negotiates for the friars' release. And this is one of the more interesting things, that 
uh, we'll come back to probably uh, at some point or certainly in uh, discussion. This is what the Wally demand in exchange for the safe release of this friar. Six knives with yellow handles. Uh, bundles of beads, three of them, each carrying 20 to 70 strings of beads. Six hatchets, one, 12 iron axes, one white blanket. Four muskets, I think they're giving them muskets, although it's, very, it's unclear the way that it's uh, recorded in the documents because at the time, of course, the Spanish were not permitted to exchange weapons with uh, Indians. And, but I think they're giving them uh, four mu uh, muskets. And then they say, we want those young boys back. We want those young boys who'd been taken to St. Augustine two years ago, and we want them back. So the governor agrees to this exchange. He sends for the young boys and all of these goods, goes back up to the exchange point, and something goes awry. And the Spanish never write about it. But somehow they're able to keep the young boys, they never give them back, and they capture seven more young boys, including this uh, guy, Lucas, who is uh, waterboarded uh, later in the story. They bring these uh, young Indians uh, back, they get the friar back, and the governor has him in St. Augustine and, and says, look, I need you to testify into uh, what happened over the course of your 10 months in captivity. And the friar refuses. He says, because of the vows I have taken, uh, I cannot testify in any matter that will involve uh, the persecution of those found guilty for this uh, uprising. So anybody who's going to be condemned to corporal punishment of any kind, uh, he is by law uh, required to recuse himself from this. Does he have a little bit of Stockholm sy Syndrome? Well, his captivity narrative, which I encourage all of you to read, uh, presents some, I think, wonderful examples that there might be some of that, at which point, one of the points, he get, enters into all these wonderful uh, theological uh, debates with uh, Wale Indians about uh, why he should convert to their faith, uh, because his faith is absolutely meaningless, and that everybody knows that you take with you in the afterlife what you possess in this life, and so his afterlife is going to be very unpleasant. Uh, and so they want him to convert. They uh, actually offer him a young Indian woman to marry, uh, she prepares him a meal in the bed, uh, at which point he bursts into tears and runs into the woods and claims that he resisted uh, this. <clears throat> uh, we'll see. In any case, he refuses to testify and says, look, you have seven captives. Uh, why don't you ask them? Very shortly thereafter, he leaves uh, Florida, goes to Cuba, uh, and then returns to Spain, where he lives the next 20 years as a Franciscan friar and, and dies in Toledo and is buried at uh, San Juan de los Reyes in Toledo in 1617. Uh, he writes this captivity narrative. The, the original's never been found. Only Ore's copy of it. Um, did he really write this account? Well, last year in, in Madrid, I found an inventory for some books that were in the uh, Franciscan Friary uh, Library in Madrid. One of them was his book. So it's there. Uh, it's just not been located uh, anywhere. Anyway, it's a fascinating account, and, and we might come back to it at some point. Well, the seven boys are all interrogated, and so what do these young boys say? Well, of course, all of them say that they, had not, they were not physically present when any of the friars were killed, uh, except for Lucas, who said, well, I showed up late, and my resident friar was dead, but I was certainly not involved in any of this. Well, this, uh, the, the story of Lucas is, I, I think, worth... Uh, saying, saying something about because it is one of the tragic elements that Carolyn mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the introduction. Lucas says that he wasn't there when one of the murders took place. So a few days later, the governor uh, brings in a couple of translators uh, to threaten him. And one of the translators is a young Indian boy named Amador. At the time, Amador is probably about 12 years old. So when he had been taken in 1595 to train as, a, as an interpreter, to uh, be converted to Christianity, he might have been 10, 9 or 10 years old. At this point, he's 12. The governor calls him in to translate, 
And who should he see but Lucas, who just so happens to be his brother? So he's translating as the governor is saying, we're going to lie you down on a rack. We're going to bind your feet and hands. Uh, two garrotes are going to be tightened around each leg, one over the thigh, the other over the calf, just below the knee. And the governor has ordered that four cuartillos of water, it's about half a gallon of water, are to be poured into his mouth and nose, and a thin piece of cloth is to be inserted so that he can't spit the water out. It's a 16th century waterboarding. Uh, you know, not something that was invented in Florida. We see elements of this uh, here as well. Uh, it was an effective use of uh, torture in uh, early modern period and even before. Well, Lucas, of course, then testifies that he was uh, one of the participants and uh, he's executed the next day. So what happens to Domingo? We, we have to go back to this Domingo character who looks like he should be the one that the Spanish are really after. Well, the Spanish never launch another punitive expedition into Wale territory this entire time. This idea that uh, Ore writes in his chronicle, he simply says, well, the Spanish launch punitive expedition after punitive expedition. They burn down crops, they burn down residences, and after four years, the Wale grow weary of this and they sue for peace. This is how the uprising story ends in the 16th century chronicle that, in the, sorry, the 17th century chronicle that Ore published. Well, the Spanish don't launch any more punitive expeditions. In fact, they start trading with them almost immediately. There are no uh, expeditions to find Domingo. They don't launch any campaigns to search for him. They have the friar back, and that's it. It's left at that. And they start to, once again, negotiate with elites. Shortly thereafter, some of the Wale elites start showing up in St. Augustine. And they meet with the governor and they say, gosh, you know, we're really sorry about those friars. We didn't know you'd take it so harshly, uh, but they were a meddlesome bunch and probably deserved uh, what they uh, received. At which point the governor said, yeah, but look, you can't do that kind of thing. Uh, and so uh, had you been Christians a long time, I'm, I promise you I would have punished you much more harshly. But what I'd like you to do now is to go to the Franciscan friary and apologize. Which, of course, they do, and relations then become normalized. Well, who should show up in early 1601 but Don Domingo? And the only way the Spanish governor can get Domingo to come to St. Augustine is if he leaves a captain, a high-ranking military captain, at Asau as a guarantee uh, of safe passage, which he does. Don Domingo shows up in St. Augustine. He falls to the governor's feet and says, you know, I'm really sorry about, uh, you know, what happened to the friars. Uh, you know, I apologize. Uh, but Don Juanillo ordered us to do this. And I am now paramount chief of Wale. He self-proclaims. Nowhere in the 16th century is the chief of Asao ever referred to as the paramount chief. It's always the chief at Tolomato, without exception. Well, Domingo's now saying, I'm the paramount chief, the Mico Mayor. The governor then accepts his apology. He too has to apologize to the Franciscans, and he leaves. He then appears again later that same year, about six months later, and he says, look, Don Juanillo and Don Francisco have uh, fled into the interior, and I think the only way that Wale territory will be pacified is if we get rid of them. So I'm asking for your authority to assemble a 500-man warrior party and move into the interior to find these guys. The governor agrees. He gives them one Spanish soldier to go as, a, um, as an observer and one translator. The rest of the war party are made up of Wale and another group of Indians, it's not important at this stage, uh, who come in. This chief, for example, at Turufina, that's where the one friar was held captive for 10 months. He's now uh, assembling a war party to go after Juanillo. Uh, uh, Wale, same thing. Uh, the Salchiche, uh, same thing, Talapo. In other words, many of these people were people who participated in the murders of the friars in 1597. Well, he assembles this 500-man war party. They move into the interior of Georgia to a place called the Fusinique. We don't, again, don't know where this site is. And they launch this assault. Uh, 
and they're initially um, uh, rebuffed, and some of the war party gets killed, and some are injured, and uh, they regroup, at which point Don Domingo says, everyone just launch an attack on this site uh, at the same time. As soon as you enter into the uh, uh, fortress, just fire your arrows. Well, the dust settles, and Don Juanillo and Don Francisco and 24 of their immediate kin are all dead. The women and the commoners who are with them are taken captive. The, uh, the elites, are, their bodies are brought out, at which point Don Domingo looks at the uh, survivors, the women, the family members of these uh, warriors, and he does something that I've not seen anywhere else in any of the uh, documents. He looks at the women and children and, and their uh, colleagues and says, I want you to scalp your dead kin. which they do. He's instructed, of course, to give the heads of Don Francisco and Don Juanillo back to the Spaniards so he can take it to the Spanish governor to prove that these guys are, in fact, dead. Uh, he doesn't. He gives them Don Juanillo's scalp. What happens with Francisco's scalp, nobody says, but it's unlikely he was willing to uh, give up the most valuable of the scalps that he had acquired uh, in this uh, particular uprising. He then instructs the governor to send six Spanish soldiers, purely symbolic, six Spanish soldiers up to Wale so that, in his words, all of the chiefs in the area recognize that I'm in charge. And the governor does. He sends six people up, and uh, Don Domingo is paramount chief of Wale territory. Now, we see him for the last time, at least I found him for the last time, in 1606. Uh, so five years after this uh, coup, in effect, has taken place, and there is a new ecclesiastical inspection and the reestablishment of missions in Wale territory. Whoop. So the missions are going back. And the new mission at Asau is being christened. And who should be the one who guides this bishop, a bishop who had arrived from Cuba to inspect this entire area, to perform baptisms and uh, confirmations, and to christen the new missions in the territory? Don Domingo is the guide. And he escorts the bishop through all of these sites. They get to Asau. And what do you suppose they christen Asau's new Franciscan mission. Santo Domingo de Asao. Coincidence? And thus ends, he says at this point, the Wale is pacified and no more trouble. And the friars actually go back and, and there, are, um, there are no more episodes like this. In fact, this episode is quite rare for the entire uh, 16th century. And on that note, I think I'm probably way over time. I just wanted to put out my special thanks. I threatened to chain myself to my desk here last year. Uh, it was a great experience. Obviously, Jake Kislak and Carolyn and Mary Lou and the entire Kluge staff and, um, and Barbara Tenenbaum in the Hispanic Reading Room, uh, David Hurst Thomas from the American Museum of Natural History, and the Edward John Noble Foundation, and then, of course, some just outstanding students I've had who uh, helped with uh, some of the projects. Kathleen Gre uh, Cole, uh, who is uh, co-author of this work, and Sabre Gray, and all of the felly, fe my fellow Kluge scholars who were here last year, uh, and my wife who puts up with me and working on murder and martyrdom tales, and the Florida Humanities Council, so thank you. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. Yes. I was wondering, uh, with regard to the canonization of the friars, yes. how actively was the Vatican pursuing Well, you know, when they learned in Savannah, because it's the, the, the Savannah di diocesis that made the formal petition, and when they learned about the book, boy, were they nervous. You know, and they were, we were getting all kinds of queries. What is this guy doing with this uprising book? The petition is at the Vatican. The, um, the last I heard was that it was supposed to have been argued uh, in the summer. Uh, 
but I've not heard any kind of update for that, so that might have been postponed. You know, in the end, the claim for canonization Sorry. rests on this notion that the friars died be in protection of the institution of marriage. And that's why they were killed. In the end, there's nothing in the documentary evidence that suggests that that could not have been a reason. Certainly the uh, Wale chiefs and others who uh, later testified uh, complained about interference. I'm not sure that that's the reason why. I think there are all kinds of uh, theories that one could put forward. <clears throat> But that's one of them, and the seven young boys said one of the things that the friars were trying to do was uh, limit the practice of polygamy, especially among the elite uh, who already had uh, wives, obviously, and had been baptized. So in the end, there's nothing in there that will railroad the campaign. I think what the, at least for me, what the episode is so useful from the perspective of a historian is that when you have episodes like this, they tend to generate a great deal of documentation. And so, you know, I only talked about one part of this story, which was the story of Don Domingo, really, and, and, and his uh, neglect in all of the, uh, of the literature. But it also shows, I think, very uh, challenging relationships between secular officials and the Franciscans. <clears throat> the governor in St. Augustine despised the fr friars, and, and they despised him. In fact, he writes letters back to the crown saying the friars deserve to get killed. Uh, and they deserved it because they were interfering in matters that they have no business interfering. If anybody's going to interfere in succession or anything internal in the politics of these local chiefdoms, it's the governor. The friars have no right to do that. So if, in fact, that's what they were doing, they deserved it. Well, you can imagine how that went over with the friars who, from the beginning, launch a campaign to get this guy fired, as does the treasurer. And he's an ally with the friars, and they despise him. So on one level, the book also exposes these uh, fissures in terms of the way that uh, St. Augustine was governed and the, the disputes over control and power uh, between secular officials sometimes and, and between the friars. But the other thing is, I think that it, it, it's so useful, even though we're reading almost everything through Spanish eyes. You're trying to interpret and explain motivations through a very difficult and uh, uh, problematic lens. And that is you know, what the friars write. And so part of what we need to do is think about, well, what is it that the Indians actually do? What do we see in terms of their actions? So one of the things that I, I didn't discuss that I think uh, reveals another dimension to this, the, the book, I think, exposes some broader disputes over indigenous control. Uh, the Spanish at this time, their control is tenuous at best. And one could pose the question, why do the local, the Wale or Mokama or Tamuqua even tolerate Spanish presence? They could easily uh, assemble a war party of 500, 700, 1,000 people and effectively get rid of them. Well, what is it that they really want from Spaniards? Well, they want luxury goods. They want goods that uh, are reflections of political power. So when you see those artifacts that, you, that the Wale demanded in exchange for uh, Avila, there's no way the Spanish are going to get this guy back. They don't even try to get him back. So why not say, we want 5,000 axes. We want 300 hoes. One white blanket? Who gets the one white blanket? And more importantly, who distributes that one white blanket? And we see that when uh, Domingo assembles his war party, the only way he can get those people to fight is if he gives those chiefs and elite warriors uh, Spanish luxury goods, beads, axes, hoes, clothing. And so one of the things, uh, uh, again, that I didn't have time to, if I could get to it, uh, to explain. You know, when a new governor arrives in St. Augustine, uh, the uh, 
Indians from Central Florida all the way up to South Carolina uh, are in St. Augustine within a week. I'm not kidding. And here's just what the Treasury, the Royal Treasury, distributed to Indian chiefs in the month before the uprising started. And you see that most of the goods, you know, the food, the flour and the maize, all of that food is for their time while they're in St. Augustine. But they do get to eat flour, the elite. Uh, this is something that most Spaniards in St. Augustine are not eating a great deal of flour. They're eating indigenous food. They're eating maize and they're eating seafood. Uh, the uh, indigenous elite eat uh, or are given how much they in enjoyed eating flour is another matter, but they were certainly given uh, uh, flour. And then you look at the other items, you know, the axes and the hoes, and then you look at all of this below. This is clothing. And some of these chiefs are coming into St. Augustine where they're being tailor, having tailor-made suits with ruffled collars from Holland and French uh, cotton. And they're having these suits tailor-made for them and then going back to their communities dressed in uh, Spanish uh, regalia. So one of the female chiefs actually comes to St. Augustine and she has tailor-made for her a bright yellow taffeta gown that she wears around Cumberland Island in about 1602. So the imagery in all of this is, it really goes back to one of the questions that we're struggling with as, uh, as historians of that period, and that, that is this question of assessing what is the source of chiefly power? Where does that power come from? Is it territorial? Uh, is it spiritual? And on one level, I, I think there's certainly a, a religious component, an ideological component to it. The territorial component is really challenging. Uh, and how much that plays a role, I think, uh, is, is still uh, unclear. But the redistributive power that chiefs have as those individuals who are the ones who issue the most prized luxury items as a source of power uh, seems to be critical in all of this negotiation. This is what they want from Spaniards. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think on one level, it, it demonstrates very clearly the limitations of the power that the Franciscans have. In all of their letters, they'll simply write back, yes, they've all converted because I'm a spectacular Franciscan, and all of these Indians have converted. When in reality, and this is something we see in, in pre-Columbian burials, very rich grave good offerings, and some of the grave goods are not just beads, some of them are... are um, are pre-Columbian artifacts, you know, with rattlesnake iconography and shells that continue to be important, uh, shell beads, not just European beads. It's very clear, uh, at least to me, that this particular church, at this particular church, the Franciscans recognize that there's no way we are going to be able to uh, engage in um, uh, a process of conversion without accommodating the things that these that the Wale elite want. These are elite burials. They're not, these are not commoners who are getting buried in this church. These are the elite and some of them, you know, I wish we could find out some more about the identity. You know, one of them is a female who has, I think, the, the richest bead assemblage of any of the burials in that entire uh, church. And she died probably somewhere almost uh, when the British came in and burned that mission to the ground in the 1680s. So uh, she probably died even, you know, late 1670s, early 1680s. She was only about 20 years old. And, uh, and I think with the documentation and starting to be a little bit more sensitive to uh, in indigenous voices, uh, we might be able to identify uh, who this woman was. So far, I haven't seen a female chief from that island, but it's a possibility. Uh, no one has a, as a, uh, an assemblage as rich as, as hers. But the other thing about the beads is, you know, they come from all over the place. And these are not cheap. You know, when you read the Spanish documents and say, well, we gave them some trinkets, some beads, I think one's immediate mental image is something 
almost the equivalent of a plastic bead that you'd find in a Cracker Jack box, you know, or something that's kind of colorful, or beads you, you find in New Orleans. For, uh, but these are hand-blown, absolutely spectacular pieces. Uh, and so, and we see those only in the elite burials. Once you get outside and the more, the archeological work, at least on St. Catherine's Island, uh, the bead assemblages become smaller beads. You know, they're small, uh, either they're the really early kind of turquoise beads, but the, the, the bead assemblages are not the kind of elite beads that one sees in that burial. You know, the other thing they found in that church, inside the church, were these masks. Now, initially, uh, when that church burned to the ground, the roof caved in and one of the walls fell down. And when they lifted up the church, they, they found on the side uh, these three masks. Well, what do they represent? You know, and initially, some of the people there said perhaps they could have been part of the art for the Stations of the Cross. And they don't look like anything I've ever seen for, for that. Uh, some claim that they could be cherubs. They don't look like cherubs to me either. These are clearly Wale masks, uh, and what they represent, we still don't know exactly, but these were inside the church. So it's very clear those who are decorating and those who are using it as a sacred space have tremendous input in the way that sacred space is used. I wish there were. You know, there isn't anything. It wouldn't be surprising, but they didn't. There's nothing that they found at that archaeological site to indicate that there was something earlier. It's not far from where they found some mounds, some burial mounds, but they didn't build on top of that. And so it's a great question. The, I wish we, we could find more of these churches, and then we'd know, do they all look like this one? Are there variations? Is this unique, what's happening on St. Catherine's Island, and it's different elsewhere? Is this the kind of thing you find if we find the church in St. Augustine? Because, boy, would that be telling right where this, the one place where there are lots of Spaniards. Uh, are they having this uh, in the churches in St. Augustine as well? I mean, it's not surprising. Certainly what we know from Mexico and other parts of Mesoamerica and the Andean world uh, we're beginning to see that there's a lot more, that the religious change is a lot more complex and certainly not guided uh, solely by uh, priests and friars. Are we way over? Sorry, I apologize. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.